Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last week, the uh, emphasis in our message, and in the first half of Ephesians chapter 4, was that there's a newly inaugurated King of heaven and earth, our Lord Jesus. And since he has risen to, get, risen to power, he get, has given to the church, uh, to you and me, gifts, including the role of of leadership. The church is supposed to be a leader in the world. The world needs good Christians who lead, who put, putting the Father's policies into place and showing other people the, the right approach to life. In other words, we believe that the most important solution is not found in a particular nation or even in a particular party, but in what Jesus calls the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And this kingdom, Jesus says, is, can be, not be seen on a map, but rather it begins in human hearts. And it centers on forgiveness, reconciliation, a faithfulness to God, taking seriously what Jesus says, putting it into practice pursuing righteousness or, or that which is good and getting rid of that which is evil. However, it's, it's very tempting to fall prey to solutions that sound more bold and powerful rather than focusing on Jesus' words when it comes to our salvation and, and defining our lives. Decisive actions that promise to fix things and um, sometimes give us villains to attack and blame or heroes to worship and follow. Uh, for instance, I mean, these, are, these examples are always true, but it seems to me that they've ramped up in intensity in the last couple of years. For instance, it was very easy for Democrats to vilify President Trump and worship pre their policy or President Biden. And, and likewise, it's easy for Republicans to do the exact opposites. It's, it is good, I'm not trying to say, it's good and it's better to have um, good rulers on this earth, and we should do what we can to do that. However, I wish that all Christians of all political stripes would spend less time vilifying or hero-worshipping particular political parties or leaders and spend more time right, championing, championing the cause of Jesus. Now, I can understand how non-believers would pin all their hopes on a political leader, because what else do they have? What other hope do they have? That's the only way that, that many people think they can actually change anything. But Christians have more uh, balance in our lives, and we should know better. Jesus is our Lord, no matter who is in power, and no matter what they do. But admittedly, it's, it's hard work to do that. It, it's hard to forgive. It's hard to turn the other cheek. It's also hard to speak the truth in love. But it's really easy. It's easy to hate. It's easy to be enraged by what's going on in the world or in politics or in the Olympics. It's a good deal harder to actually love my neighbor or to be kind <laughs> when online. It's hard work to care for God's creation, whether it's plants, animals, or human beings. And it's much easier to, to, for instance, watch TV or cruise the web than it is to do a devotion or reach out to someone. It won't get you these things that are part of God's kingdom. They won't get you as many likes or as many friends or as many comments. But it will do much more to further God's kingdom. And one great, oh, and, uh, one great advantage in uh, knowing that Jesus is Lord over all is that we no longer need, oh, can we go, oh yeah, this is right. We no longer need to fear. That doesn't mean that we, I'm not saying we should be stupid, and I don't mean that as an excuse to be unkind or arrogant, but what I do mean is that our highest priority should be following the instructions of our Lord, and that we can trust him to take care of us no matter what happens. And therefore, because we know that God is in control, we can be bold as those who are in Christ, not fearful 
but victorious. Jesus is our Lord, and that means that he has also, not only that he takes care of and oversees, but that he has a plan for the world that we live in, a strategy for living, and for how uh, congregations like ourselves should interact with one another and also with the world. And Christians are leaders in this regard. I think we don't often think of ourselves. Sometimes we, again, last week I mentioned that we sometimes go into survival mode or we circle the wagons and uh, we forget that God has called us to lead, that we should be showing the world the, the right way to live with one another and with God. Christians should not simply be armchair quarterbacks, you know, those who sit back and point out what everyone else is doing wrong, but are too lazy or scared to actually go out and lead. Our job is to lead. It's one thing to identify the problems of this world, but instead of simply waiting for other people to fix the solutions or to provide the answer or simply thinking, all right, here's option A and option B, and those are the only options we have to fix things, what we should do is keeping Christ in the center, actually go out and make a difference on the ground where we can. And with maybe not the whole world, maybe not with all of Ohio or even Hamilton County, but with those with whom are around us. And I say instead of letting one extreme or the other frame our thinking about things like technology or internet, pollution, poverty, a broken relationship, why doesn't the church take the lead by following the lead of Jesus. That's why I'm not satisfied with simply preaching or, or doing church stuff. I want to see Jesus' words live down, which, which is church stuff in the, in the real sense, but it's not always thought about in, as church stuff. And I think that that's who we are. It is who we are. It's who Jesus has called us to be, because through Jesus, through the gospel and Christian community, we can do a more thorough job of helping this world than anyone else. We are, after all, the body of Christ, and we are the hands and feet of our Savior. We go with the gospel, showing compassion, helping, speak, helping speaking the truth to a confused world, and above all, sharing Jesus and the, and the love that he has given to us, exemplified through his self-sacrifice and through the cross. So how should Christians take the lead? Well, it's a big topic. How should Grace Lutheran take the lead, and, and what can we do as individuals? Well, I think I'm going to have a sermon series on that in the fall, a little bit of a, a different approach. Its goal is always certainly to be biblical and faithful to the example of Jesus, but uh, instead of just taking readings in order, we're going to take readings that address specific issues like technology, internet, racism, abortion, pollution, and poverty, among others. And we'll talk about um, what the Lord says about these things and how we can lead in this regard. But we uh, unfortunately won't get into that today. That's too big a topic to bite off uh, in, one, in one sermon. Today, Paul wants us to simply focus on the mission. And in order to do that, he tells us something important, something essential, something that is not just kind of a one-time thing that we can check off, but a constant battle, and that is to avoid things that distract us or pull us in the wrong direction. You can't do the mission if you're doing something else, right? If you're fighting, you can't do the mission unless the mission is to fight. If you have no time, you can't do the mission. If you have no committed people, well, you can't do the mission. Certainly, if you don't trust Jesus, you can't, and you won't want to do the mission. Now, there's a, a lot of things in this world that can distract us, but the biggest and most harmful distractions are what the Bible calls sin which is why Paul encourages us not to get stuck, not to get stuck in our old way of life, and not just because it's bad or tisk tisk we shouldn't do it, but because it interferes with the greater mission. Sin wrecks, wastes our time, 
and it saps our energy. And when we get distracted from the mission, well, the mission gets wrecked. So what kinds of things do we need to put behind us? Well, one particular thing that Paul brings up is dishonesty. Now, a modest start would be for us to strive to be more honest with one another, to see ourselves as teammates. Um, for instance, it's easy to talk about someone behind their back, complaining or gossiping without ever bringing our concern or complaint to them. But what does this do? What, what does that do? It tears us down. It discourages us from doing anything productive. I mean, who wants to do a project with someone they don't trust? Who, looks, who likes to work with people they complain about? Who likes to work with people who complain about them? What team could play together well if everyone hates each other's guts? If you're working against each other, it's obvious, right? If you're working against each other, you can't work together. It's simply much more productive, for instance, to help someone who is struggling or to communicate directly with them. That's one thing that Paul brings up, but there's all sorts of other sins that might and do distract us at times. And Paul's primary focus, it's interesting, on, on getting rid of evil is uncomfortably personal. It's not primarily about pointing out someone else's problem. Rather, Paul addresses each person, saying, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirits of your mind and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Later, Paul will get a little more specific, saying things like, be angry, but don't sin. Resolve your issues. Don't steal, but instead work hard so that you have enough to share with other people. Don't let corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but build each other up. Don't be hateful, but rather be kind and tender-hearted to one another. And isn't it refreshing to encounter that kind of kindness, even from those who you might not always see eye to eye with on everything? It's a joy to be around people who are even a little bit like Jesus. It's good, right, to be around trustworthy people who won't take from you, who won't lie to you, but will support you be honest with you and respectful towards you and build you up. And that's who Christ has called us to be. And that's the kind of community he wants us to foster, a community based on the gospel. And furthermore, we have the greatest example of all in our Savior who is exactly that to us. He is tenderhearted and compassionate. He could, honestly, speak all kinds of evil about us to the Heavenly Father. But instead, he builds us up. He speaks well of us. He forgives us, and he tells his Father that we are forgiven. He commends us to Almighty God. Because, the words, because of the words and sacrifice of Jesus, that means that we are part of this gospel community. Forgiven, reconciled, compassionate, and the trustworthy people of God. In Jesus' name, amen.